What love is this that you gave your life for me and made a way for me to know you? And I confess you're always enough for me. You're all I need. In that good song, Jesus is always enough, amen? Well, we're very pleased this morning to have uh, what has already become a good friend of mine. Many of you remember Sonny Tucker, who was the team leader over um, evangelism and church growth. Um, Terry, that's not all of our people leaving. That's children's church leaving, so uh, don't be so worried, yeah. More than that leave when they know I'm preaching, so it's all right. But um, Sonny has uh, took the promotion up to the executive secretary position or the head position for our Arkansas Baptist State Convention. And um, Terry Bostick is back. He was here before and went out to pastor a church. Uh, you know, he's not really tough enough to do that. And so he came back to the convention. <laughs> But I've already come to know Terry and love him. And uh, so he, uh, we had a deacon's retreat planned, and uh, we had some things come up. Many of you know that uh, Rodney Weeks' grandmother uh, passed away, and so we felt it uh, the right thing to do for us to go to that funeral, and we still think that, of course. And so uh, Terry's been so gracious to go ahead and come up this weekend and, um, and preach for us today. Can I just tell you that, that I love our convention? Uh, ever since I've been in ministry, I was telling Terry this, even, you know, and I, I don't know much of what to do now, but when I first got into ministry and I was trying to lead choirs and stuff, I was dumb as a rock. And I would, uh, I would go to a guy named Glenn Ennis down at the, at the convention, and I'd say, Glenn, can you come fix this? Can you come straighten this out? And, and he was always there. Uh, started my music uh, training through volunteer part-time training at Camp Perrin back in the day. And uh, when we were first restarting Lakeview Baptist Church down at the old campus running 3035, I'd ask these guys to come up. And I said, look, guys, I can't offer you a dime. You're going to have to pay your own hotel, pay your own way. And they didn't even blink an eye. They were here. Everything that we needed, our, our convention uh, that, we, that we give toward uh, gives back to us and all the Southern Baptist Church across. So there's my, there's my, uh, my commercial for Arkansas Baptist State Convention, but would you please give a good, warm Lakeview welcome to Terry Bostick. Thank you, Pastor. Not today, buddy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What a joy to be with you today. Did I turn my mic on correctly? All right. I, uh, I have been so excited to hear the story of Lakeview and what has happened, what God's done here, and uh, I can't wait to go and and share that news with some churches really across this state that need to know uh, what can happen when God gets in front of a church. And so, guys, I get to go tell your story all over Arkansas. And so thank you for letting me be a part, Brother Johnny. I'm jealous of pastors that can sing. Uh, I just, I mean, I, I didn't want to say I don't like it, but I really don't. I sit on the front row so nobody can hear me sing and I can praise the Lord. I can't wait till I get to heaven till I get my voice where I can sound good in front of other people. But uh, y'all have an amazing church, and uh, thank you, worship leaders. Y'all did a great job. And, and one more thank you, guys. The cooperative program is one of the, the best things that God ever led the Southern Baptist Convention to do in its history of sending missionaries out, supporting churches all over this state. Uh, there was a time, uh, Brother Johnny, when y'all needed more help than you do now. Now y'all can be a church that helps others. 
And let me tell you, there are a lot of churches that need help. And you help me. You pay my salary. You help with my mileage and ministry expenses for me to go all over the state and consult with churches and help them. So thank you for your sacrificial giving. Even in the middle of all the building you're doing, you're still being faithful to the cooperative program. So once again, let me tell you, thank you for doing that and being that kind of church. If you would, open your Bibles to John chapter 9. If you haven't figured out already, I'm not from Arkansas. My accent is a little bit farther south. Any of you ever heard of the Duck Commander? That's home. I'm from West Monroe, Louisiana. That's where my brother are. That's where my brother is. See, my brother are. That's where my brother are. Um, and uh, my mom and my, my wife's from West Monroe and uh, her family. So we, we come from... Uh, from that part, of, if you go and you open the trunk of my, uh, or the back side of my truck there, you'll find my shotgun and my waders, and all that is true. <laughs> so uh, what a joy to be with you. I'm going to read an extended passage here today, and uh, we're going to look at a man who comes to faith in Christ. And one of the reasons I like to preach this is sometimes we, I think, get a distorted view of what coming to Christ means. A lot of times we hear testimonies of people who have uh, kind of a testimony like Paul. I mean, lightning strikes and they get radically saved. And those testimonies are, are just incredible to hear. And let me tell you something, I'm not here to say those aren't real. I think they're real. I think they happen. And you may have one of those testimonies. But you know, a lot of people don't come to Christ that way. A lot of us come to Christ in, in basically what we could call stages or a process of, of, of God revealing himself to us more and more and our heart being open to him. And so how many of you are familiar with Where's Waldo? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Even grandparents raising their hand. We're going to do a little Where's Waldo because as we're reading this story and as we begin to unfold this uh, this verse and this passage and, and look at the different stages. What I want you to do is identify where you are in this process as we see how this man comes to Christ. Let's begin reading chapter 9, verse 1. As he was passing by, he, being Jesus, saw a man blind from birth. His disciples questioned him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. It was common in that day for people to understand that sin carried over into our physical life and uh, people who were born with any kind of, of deformity or disease or, or any kind of illness like that, it was often assumed that they sinned in the womb even. They, they understood that at this time, that that could happen, or that the parents may have sinned. And that's what the disciples saw. Let's look at what happened when Jesus comes into the situation. In verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This all came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work, but as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground. Now, any country boys in here today? Aren't you glad Jesus knows how to spit? Can I just... I mean, we know Jesus was a country boy. He wasn't some fancy academician that didn't have uh, any idea what was going on in the real world. He was a real man. And I like that about Jesus. This is not the only time in the Bible it says Jesus spit. Now, don't go tell your mama I said you can spit. You spit in the house, you're going to get in trouble, even in the country. Isn't that right? But we know Jesus was a country boy, all right? And he made some mud from the spit, and he spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he left, washed, and came back seeing. His neighbors and those who formerly had seen him as a beggar said, Isn't this the man who sat begging? And some said, He's the one. No, others were saying, but he looks like him. Therefore they asked him, Then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So when I went and I washed, I received my sight. Where is he, they asked. I don't know, he said. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day that Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. 
So again, the Pharisees asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, he told them. I washed and I can see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others in the crowd were saying, How can a sinful man perform such signs as there was a division among them? Again, they asked the blind man, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He's a prophet, he said. The Jews did not believe this about him that he was blind and received sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had received sight. And they asked them, Is this your son, the one who was born blind? How then does he now see? We know this is our son and that he is born blind, his parents answered. But we don't know now how he sees, and we don't know who opened his eyes. I love this part. Ask him... He's of age. He will speak for himself. Now, guys, if you don't know this, his parents just sold him down the river. Now, I have children. I have a child. She's 21. And let me just ask a question. Let me get an amen from a parent in here. Has your child ever done something that embarrassed you? (laughs) Amen. Now, not all of it bad. Some of it's just him telling the truth or her telling the truth about you in front of somebody that you didn't want them to know that. But sometimes our kids do something that embarrasses love. We can identify with these parents. And as we read this story, we realize that the parents want this guy to answer for himself because they're scared of what's about to happen. Let's keep reading in the story. Verse 22 says, His parents said these things (coughs) because they were afraid of the Jews. Since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogues. And that's why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. That's like on, uh, on the, the cop show and, and when they come and they search the home, those parents that, that don't tell them where they are. I've already told my daughter, I'm pointing you out. You better go hide somewhere else. Well, they were really f- afraid that if they had anything to do with this miracle that that they would be cast out from their family and their relations and the ability to do business and the, the ability to worship. So already everybody in the community knew, and this is important for understanding this story, that to take the side of Jesus was to be against all of what the people and popular opinion was about. As we keep reading this story, they come to him a second time. And the man who had been blind, and they told him, give glory to God. We want to know, we know that this man is a sinner. Now, when that verse says, give glory to God there, that really, you can misread that and think that they're trying to tell him uh, uh, to give glory to God and not to give glo- you know, not to raise Jesus' name. But really, that was kind of a, a way that they would say, tell the truth. Quit lying. They they really weren't interested in honoring God, y'all. They were trying to get him to tell the truth because they didn't believe it. In verse 25, uh, he says this. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I already told you, he said, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? Do you hear the sarcasm in that, guys? I mean, this guy, this guy, he didn't have an education, but he just questioned all the PhDs in the room. He just mocked them. And let's see what happens. Let's see how they react to them. They ridiculed him. You're that man's disciples, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man... We don't know where he's from. And once again, this country boy wisdom comes out. That's why we can't ever confuse an education with a degree. This guy knows some stuff, okay? In verse 30, he says this, This is an amazing thing. You don't know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. Throughout history, no one, this is very important for this story, guys, no one has ever heard 
of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. What he's saying is, is we have, at this time, we had uh, healings and we had medicine that if somebody had an injury or an infection to their eye, that they could be treated and perhaps get their vision back. But what this guy is saying, and the Pharisees don't argue, is that they had never in the history of their nation ever heard of somebody being born blind that could now see. I mean, this was not a miracle simply. This was a miracle to the nth degree. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Verse 34, this is their reaction. You were born entirely of sin, they replied, and you're trying to teach us. And then they threw him out. Now, the Greek word there means chunked, all right? This was not escorted out. Do you all know what chunked out means? All right, they, they, they threw him out. This was not a, a discussion and disagreement that ended in people walking away okay. They chunked him out. They were not happy with this guy. When Jesus heard, I love this verse, when Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out, he found him. And asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? Get this. He's talking to Jesus, the man that just healed him. And he says, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus answered, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we aren't blind too, are we? Verse 41, if you were blind, Jesus told him, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Now let me quickly go through since it was such a long story and share with you these steps as I see them being played out in this story. We find the first step or the first stage in this process right there in verse 1. It says that he was passing by and he saw a man blind from birth. And this is the first stage is that we have no knowledge of Jesus. I call this being blind. And this is how all of us come into the world. And this is how many people exist today. If you were raised in church and heard your mother and father pray at the table and pray and take you uh, and read your Bible and pray with you at night and all that, then you grew up hearing the name of Jesus. But at one time, you were blind. You had no knowledge of who Jesus was. You never heard the name. This is not the case of, of, of some friends knowing that Jesus was in town healing and and putting their friend on a mat and running to town and digging a hole in the roof and dropping them in. This man didn't know who Jesus was, didn't know what Jesus could do, and probably didn't even know that Jesus was in town. He was absolutely blind to who Jesus was. There was no hope for him to be saved, to be healed. But Jesus saw him. Now look at John 9, verse 11. He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me, Go to Siloam and wash it. So, then they ask him, Where is he? He said, I don't even know where he is. So now, somehow, this man is aware that it was Jesus who healed him. He doesn't know what Jesus looks like. And even though he may have very sensitive hearing because he was blind, he didn't recognize his voice because later in the story he meets Jesus and doesn't recognize him, does he? So he doesn't know what Jesus looks like. All he knows is that a man named Jesus brought sight to his blind eyes. I call this stage in the process being aware. He was now aware of the name of Jesus. There was something different about this name, Jesus. 
Look, guys, there are plenty of people in Arkansas who are right here in this stage. They've heard the name of Jesus, but they're not saved. And let me tell you something else that I, that I want you to understand, that there are people who literally don't know anything about Jesus right here in Arkansas. And that's why God hadn't called the church out, is that there are still people here that need to hear his name. So this man goes from being blind, not even knowing anything of Jesus, to being aware of something being different about this man named Jesus. Now, I will grant you this, that probably most of the people that we're going to run into have probably heard the name of Jesus. Maybe they heard it when they said the Lord's Prayer before a game in high school or, or when they prayed it uh, before the football game when they were in high school. doesn't mean they're saved, but they're aware. But that still doesn't make them a believer, does it? So let's look at the next stage. As we look at the next stage, you'll find that in verse 17. As they've called him in again, this guy's being interrogated these Pharisees must have taught the CIA and the FBI what to do because they asked him about three or four different times. So they brought him in again, and they asked the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And this is his response. I want you to pay very close attention to his response. This is his response. He is a prophet. Now, a prophet doesn't mean the Son of God. A prophet doesn't mean the Messiah. A prophet doesn't mean that he uh, understood everything about Jesus. But the term prophet does have, it does have some positive connotation, does it not? He didn't call him a magician. He didn't call him a trickster. He didn't call him a con man. He at least called him a prophet. And what that tells me is that this man is now at least open his heart and his mind are open to the possibility that Jesus is a good man and may have something for him. Now, there are a lot of people that you're going to run in, uh, that you work with, that are maybe in your family, that are aware of Jesus, but they are not open. Have y'all ever met anybody like that? And when you try to bring up spiritual things, they don't want anything to do with it because their heart and their mind are closed. Well, this is an example of, in this process of where they are. This man has made a significant step because he is now open to the possibility that Jesus is a good thing. And man, I, I'm just here to tell you, does our media not make church and Jesus a bad thing today? Oh, guys, we minister in a world where Jesus is not a good thing. In our popular culture, church and Jesus is not a good thing. So when we as believers move somebody to being open to Jesus being a good thing, do you realize that that is a significant accomplishment for the kingdom? You can't get to the last stage until you get over that barrier and be open to the things of God. And guys, we, we celebrate baptism and we should. And we celebrate sharing the gospel, and we should. But there's a whole lot more to leading someone to Jesus Christ than just knowing the four laws. It's knowing how to move people through these stages so that they're open to the gospel. Let me tell you something. If they're not open to the gospel, <laughs> preaching the four laws is not what's going to open them. You know what's going to open them? You being the neighbor and the boss, and the co-worker, and the wife, and the husband, and the son and daughter that God has called you to be in front of them to earn the right for them to say this, there's something different about Terry. So now he's open. He's gone from being blind to aware to now he's open. But that's not the last stage. In verse 31, we come across what is another important stage in this step towards Jesus Christ and having faith in him. In verse 31, this is what we read. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. 
throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Do you see how his position has changed? His position has gone from now simply being prophet to he's actually now saying that this is a man of God, man from God, and he's actually defending Jesus to the Pharisees knowing that they are hostile to Jesus. And I call this step, I call this part of the process being engaged in the gospel. He is now engaged with Jesus. Jesus is now beginning a work in him where he can't turn it loose. He's not going to let them speak ill of Jesus. He is now defending Jesus. Now, if you keep reading in verse 35... Like I said, I'm, there, there's a whole sermon on verse 35, and, I, and I'm not going to preach it, I, pro, I promise, Brother Johnny. But verse 35, when Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out, he found him. Guys, there's a ton of theology right there. Amen. And let me tell you something. The, the people that this world cast out, the people who, who have suffered through drug, uh, divorce, bankruptcy, uh, unemployment, all those things, all these things that make, can make somebody in our culture a social outcast are the ones that Jesus continually went to and sought them out. You don't have to be perfect for Jesus to love you. And the perfect sinners, as Dr. Tucker said earlier this year, they're already taken. The only ones that are left are the ones that are broken. And we need to understand that Jesus wants us to go get them. That's what he modeled. This man didn't go looking for Jesus. His salvation is still not him yet. It's all Jesus. (laughs) Jesus goes and finds him. And he asks him this question, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus answered, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Now, when John uses this phrase and Jesus uses this phrase, son of God, he is using a phrase that means Messiah, the son of God. This was not a phrase that would have been unfamiliar with him. This was a title. This is the one that we're looking for. And this man is ready to believe in him. And I call this stage, and there's only one more stage after that. This stage is what I call convinced. Did you read what he said? Where is he that I may what? Worship him. He now believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the one who was sent to save the world, and he is fully convinced that Jesus is that person. But I stand before you today to tell you that that man is not yet converted. And let me stop here and just ask you a few questions. And the first and most important question I'll ask you is this. Is Satan convinced that Jesus is the Son of God? Let me tell you 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt, Satan has no doubts. Everybody in this room has more doubt about who Jesus is than Satan does. Look, we even know from Matthew chapter 4, if you want to turn there real quick, you can. I'm not going to read it, but it's the story of the temptation of Jesus Christ. Hey, Satan knows exactly who Jesus is. These guys that want to tell you that Jesus didn't figure out who he was till late in his ministry, they've, they've gone off the deep end, okay? Jesus knew exactly who he was, why he came. Satan knew the same thing, and that's why Satan met him in the wilderness, and he tempted him how many times, church? Three times, and Jesus rebuked him, but I want you to notice what it is. The last question or the last offer that Satan had was this. If you will fall down and worship me, I will give you the world. 
Because this is the difference between someone who is convinced and someone who is converted. So the next question I want to ask you is this. Why isn't Satan going to go to heaven? If he's convinced, if he believes in his head that Jesus is the Son of God, if he believes that that three days after Jesus' death he was raised from the dead, why will Satan not be in heaven? Have you ever asked that question? You see, guys, when, when we read this word believe in the Bible, we want to we wanna define it ourselves. We really do. And we talk about believing in stuff all the time. We'll say things like, well, I believe the Razorbacks are going to go undefeated this year. Hmm. We've made this word believe. We've tried to boil it down to something that we know and the gray matter stuck between our two ears. But let me tell you something. If you carefully study Scripture and you read it over and over and over again, that is where faith starts. It's not where it ends. Conversion happens in the next verse. Let's read. Verse 38, he says, I believe, Lord, he said, and then what did he do? He fell at his feet and he worshiped. Now he went from believing to being a worshiper. Let me ask you a quick question, and then then I'm going to close. Do you think this guy said, all shucks, Jesus, thanks, I'll see you next Easter? You think this guy said, you know, Jesus, you really, really made a difference in my life. I think I'm a better man because of you. Or do you think that this man's life was so radically changed, not only by his healing, but by his faith, that he fell down at the feet of Jesus and he washed Jesus' feet with his tears and he cried out to God, thanking Jesus and worshiping Jesus and saying, Jesus, 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 you are my life. You see, that's the difference, guys, between being convinced and being converted. And too many people are playing games with God today because they think, because the gray stuff in their brain is convinced that they're converted. And every day they live for themselves. It's not about Jesus. What's the difference? Let me tell you, I'm a, I'm, I'm a believer and I still sin. I still crawl up on the altar and I drag my life off the altar and I try to get in control. And and I know there are people in here today that probably when we open up the invitation and the prayer warriors come down, there may be some of you that may need to get back and say, you know what, God, I forgot how good it is to see. I forgot what it was like to be blind and I need to worship and I need to cry out and give all my life to you. And you may want to come down and make this, this into an altar for you to rededicate your life. But let me tell you something. I believe there's people here today who have been playing at this game, walking through this process, if you will, convinced but not converted. You've never trusted Jesus. You've never made him the priority of your life. Oh, you're convinced. You believe the Bible's true. You believe Jesus did what he said he did. You're not worshiping. You're not following Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, guys. Satan never worshiped Jesus. He never submitted to his teachings. He never submitted to his authority. He never said, Jesus, your will, not my will. And that's why Satan won't be in heaven. My question today is why won't you be in heaven? Is it because you want to be in control of your life and you want to do it on your own good works and you think because you know in your head 
and you don't do certain things that you're going to get to heaven, guys, stop playing that game. Surrender your life to God. Trust your eternity to Him and His righteousness. And say, God, I'm going to realign my life, and it's going to be about you, not about me, not about my comfort, not about my desires, but about you. And today you can fall at his feet and be a worshiper. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, I'm going to ask our prayer warriors, if they would, to make their way forward. And we're going to open up these steps as an altar. And if you need to be saved today, if you need to surrender your life to Jesus and and take that last step and move from being convinced to converted, don't wait one more day. Jesus is looking for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we surrender this invitation to you. God, I pray that your spirit would convict us, God, as it convinces us, and also give us the courage to come forward and say yes to Jesus today. Help us to Block the distractions of what people will think and what's going to happen next and focus on making our life right with you, Jesus. Take over this worship service. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Would you all stand? If Today's your day. Come forward and make that a reality today. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, O oh, Comforter and Friend, how we need your touch again, Holy Spirit, rain Let your power fall, 
let your voice be heard. Come and change our hearts as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit. Every head bowed, every eye closed just for a minute. I told Brother Terry, I'm certainly not going to try to re-preach his sermon, but I want to give you an opportunity. If God's speaking with you this morning about anything, this is a good time to just let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Maybe he's tugging on your shirt sleeve to come down and just offer him up praise. God, I've been doing my own thing, and I just really hadn't been living for you. And I just want you to know right now that I'm done with that, and I'm going to offer you everything. Maybe you've been coming for a while. You've been visiting. And maybe it's time now for you to step out and say, Church, I, I want to be a part of Lakeview Church. I, I'm, I'm tired of sitting on the sideline. I want to get in the game. May, maybe you're here this morning and you've had a real difficulty in life. Maybe a, an illness or maybe a job loss or maybe a problem with your relationships. Whatever that is. Why don't you come down and offer it up to God? Why don't you leave it on this altar and walk away from it? Maybe it's time this morning for you to turn your uh, life around for Christ. For you to say, God, I'm tired of having it on my own and I'm ready to give it to you. Whatever that is this morning, this verse is for you. Why don't you step out right now as we sing this verse. You come right now. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love At the feet of Jesus And we cry holy, holy, holy We cry holy, holy, holy We cry holy, 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 holy. It's the to you just for a second and I want us to have a special prayer a prayer of thanksgiving and a prayer that God will open the path in the right way can we do that before we leave is that alright you know for uh, about four years now um, we've been asking God to, to sell our old campus and with our financing package on this building uh, we have a $200,000 balloon note it was an interest only note that we figured we would sell the other place and pay that off. And, you know, as time went along there, you know, we, we began to wonder, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to pay that off? But I'll tell you what, I'm so thankful that as a church, we remained faithful. Didn't know how it was going to work. Didn't know when it was going to work. We just knew it was going to work. Amen? And so when we went into that closing office on Thursday afternoon and... Low, have mercy. All of the hoops that we had to jump through to make all that happen. You have no idea. And, um, but to see those documents signed and to see money's just money. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But to see that work and to see that taking off of us and to be able to know that that old campus down there is going gonna, is gonna to have a great new life. I, I don't have time to tell you all about it, but it's going to be a teaching center for kids and that lake and all that. 
and uh, there's actually going to be a, an area there called the Lake the, the Lakeview area room auditorium whatever it is and she asked me if that was okay and I said you know I think that'd be honoring to God and now we 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 turn from the door that's been opened by God to allow us to go through it and we have a choice we can decide to say we've went through that door and now let's sit down and take a deep breath and let's rest a while and while we do people will die and go to hell because we've not gone after them brick and mortar and all of that is just what it is it's just a tool but it's a very necessary tool for Lakeview to go out and do the job that God's laid before us and so in the next few weeks you need to be ready now I told the deacons in our prayer time this morning that uh I've been in prayer now for about three weeks about this and looking for God's leadership as pastor of our church. And I, I, I'm going to tell you that, that um, I'm, I, uh, you know, and, and unless God just strikes me down, I'm going to challenge you uh, more than we've ever challenged you before, financially, um, spiritually, and physically. And we're going to see God do something incredible over next to us here. Uh, we're going to see that building built and we're going to be in it debt free when we get finished because you're going to work and you're going to pray and you're going to give. Why do I know that? Because I know who you are. And so I want to pray right now and I want to thank God. I want to thank God for what he's done for us in these last few weeks and months. And I want to thank God in advance for what he's going to be doing in the next few weeks and months. Uh, listen, we, you know, we can't stop or even slow down the ministries that we're doing now while we're doing that. But God's going to call us and God is going to grant us the ability. You know, how, how in the world can I give more? God's going to give it to you supernaturally so that you can be a conduit through him back to be able to build. That's the way it's going to happen. And you watch and we'll give you a chance later on to tell all the stories of how God has done that. Do you agree? Let's go do God's work. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord. Lord, we stand literally amazed in your presence knowing what you have already done in our church. Lord, we think back even over the years of how, Lord, we've stepped out on faith and Lord, you've been so faithful back to us. And Lord, we get so afraid about things especially as it relates to money and all those things Lord but I pray Lord that even in our unbelief that you would give us belief even in our unfaithfulness that you'd give us faith Lord I pray that we can look back and watch what you have done and it be a springboard for what you are going to do in our lives <clears throat> so Lord we thank you for the doors you've opened we thank you even more Lord for the doors that will open. And thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to be a part of what you're doing here in Lake Game. Lord, I certainly want to thank you for uh, allowing Terry to be with us and, Lord, for challenging us with your word, Lord. And I pray, Father, that we would go from being convinced to being just convicted, Lord. So, Lord, you'd just bring us to the place that you'd have us to be. Lord, thank you for what you're even going to do in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, again, I want to thank you for being here today. I'll have Brother Terry back at the back with me. If you are on the Budget and Finance Committee meeting or the Deacons Board, Deacon Board, our meeting will be next Sunday at 4 and at 5. Today at 4 o'clock, the Building and Grounds meeting will occur. We'll meet out here in the foyer, and we'll take whatever room is not being used uh, this afternoon. So thank you again. Be sure and uh, say hello to Terry as you walk out the door. Real briefly, right after worship this morning, Cassie needs to meet with all the grandparents and the parents of the children's choir members right up front here, please, uh, real briefly after the worship center. As soon as we say amen, we need your help. We need to clear the chairs in these two sections, stack them up, and move them to the aisle. Tonight is our rescheduled uh, dinner theater that our youth is putting on, a fundraiser event. So you'll come hear some Christmas music, some other uh, music as well. Tonight, we're having dinner at uh, 6 o'clock. We, uh,